Hi, good morning everyone. I'm Dr. Enoch Daniel of the Family Health Team. Hi, I'm Dr. John Butler, also Central Lambton Family Health Team here in Petrolia. Over the past few weeks, we've heard a ton of information and it's really, really difficult to boil it all down and really understand what it is that's important about what we're watching. So what I want to do today is, we want, actually what we want to do today is we want to uh, bring to you some, the, some of the most important data that is causing us a great deal of concern. The first bit of data actually comes from a slide presentation from, from Nebraska Medical, uh, and they show the data from China, which is really, really concerning to us. So when you look at this data, the COVID mortality stats for, for anybody over the age of 60 to 69 is really concerning. So anybody in the age of 60 to 69 group will be, has a mortality rate of 3.6, 70 79 of 8.0%, and 80 plus 14.8%. But you also have to be concerned about who is at risk. We're looking at people with cardiovascular disease with a death rate of 10.5%, diabetes 7.3, and a chronic respiratory disease rate of 6.3, hypertension of 6, and some with cancer of 5.6%. These are the vulnerable patients in our practices, in our population, in our community. So these are the people that we're really worried about. I'd like to just, before we change the slide, Dr. Daniel, point out a couple of things to the people who might be watching today. A lot of people don't know what cardiovascular disease actually is. If you've ever been prescribed a nitroglycerin spray for angina or heart attack, if you've had a stent or a bypass surgery, uh, then you have cardiovascular disease. If you have hardening of the arteries in your legs, you have cardiovascular disease. Diabetes, I think most people know, but if you're taking pills or insulin, then you're at risk. And chronic respiratory disease includes asthma and COPD, so if you've ever used a puffer on a regular basis, not just for a rare bronchitis, but a regular use of a puffer, you are the person in this category that says 6.3% death rate. So when we talk about underlying diseases, those are the sorts of things that we're talking about. This curve is from Johns Hopkins University. What's concerning about this curve is that it shows a tremendous amount of uh, consistency from country to country regardless of what the basically ge genetic background is or socioeconomic background is of the country, they're very, very close. The trajectory lines are very, very similar. We don't want to get into too many technical terms, but basically we're going to point out something very simple here. If you look at the countries that have had early outbreaks, they follow the same trajectory and roughly the same kind of number of cases per person. What's different is kind of when the outbreak really starts in a given country. And for Canada, it's hard to read, but we're down here, which means we are at the very beginning. We are at the point where we haven't really seen much yet because it's just basically incubating within our population. But within a matter of days, and if you look at the time frame, this is about three weeks. So within a couple of weeks, we will probably be out here. Also concerning is that there's been an asymmetry or there's been a difference in the amount of testing available. And in Canada, frankly, we are quite behind in testing and we're quite concerned that our numbers don't reflect what's already happening. As we move to this next slide, this slide is basically, it's from um, the uh, Dalai Lama School of Public Health. And it was reported on CBC News, but you've probably seen some facsimile of this over the past couple of days. And what we're going to try to do is explain this in fairly basic, in some ways brutal terms, but to understand the strategy that's going on. This curve is really talking about flattening the curve. And you've heard that terminology probably on TV, but we're going to try to help you understand what this means. Now in the United Kingdom, they've actually taken a little bit of a different approach, at least until now, about this flattening the curve. Uh, Boris Johnson, the Prime Minister, has basically come out and said to his population, get ready, you're going to lose loved ones. The strategy there appears to be, let the population get sick, most will get better. Of the ones that won't, many will die. And then the remaining people will have some degree of immunity and provide herd immunity to the population, much like a vaccination does. There are a few problems with that approach. One of them is that we don't have any data, really, long-term data on this virus. It's new. It's novel. 
So we can't say that you're gonna build up herd immunity. We can't even say that you can't re get reinfected in a few months time. There's actually some preliminary data out of Japan and other places that suggests some people got infected more than once. Just because you build up antibodies in your system doesn't mean that the next time you're exposed to it, it will work. And it also doesn't account for the possibility of mutation. So that's the UK approach, and most countries, including ours, does not agree with that approach. Our country is going with this approach. So what you'll see here is two curves. One curve is this big peak curve that goes up and down. It doesn't specify the number of days, but basically shows a large increase in cases followed by an eventual decrease in cases after the peak. The other curve is going to ultimately have the same number of people, near the same number of people, underneath the curve, but it's flattened out. But it extends for a longer period of time. So the strategy with this is that although we're going to be all maybe sicker longer and it's going to impact our way of life for a number of months, weeks or months longer than normal, the peak is less. So why is the peak important? Much like the electrical companies who want to reduce peak because of the ability to provide electricity, we need to reduce peak because we actually have a capacity on our ability to provide health care. There are only so many doctors, so many nurses, so many hospital beds, and so many intensive care units. This disease has no cure. We depend on the immune system to beat it. And about 20% of people will need either oxygen or ventilator machine to beat this disease. If we're already near capacity in our hospital system now, it's quite concerning if we're going to have a lot of people in this area. So the Italian experience has been quite tragic. There, they had this. It happened in the richest part of Italy, arguably with as good or better health care than Canada has, very high-end equipment, ICUs, the latest technology, well-trained doctors and nurses. And yet you hear horror stories about what's happening. You could have someone who doesn't even have COVID virus come to the hospital with a heart attack, a stroke, congestive heart failure, who needs to be on a ventilator for a period of time to get them through their illness. And they die because people with COVID are occupying ventilators. Whether it's worse or not, another scenario is that people who are already on a ventilator, but they may be older and more frail, have to be taken off a ventilator and allowed to let pass away in order to save someone who has more years of life left if they can be saved. Some people call this battlefield medicine, and we are potentially there now, at least if this curve, curve happens. So in Canada, we have a great healthcare system, but like any healthcare system, it has its limits. We have a hospital system that has already most of the year, it's hospital beds occupied and many ICU beds occupied. There is an ability to do surge capacity, but it's limited. So our goal in staying at home, not hugging our friends, not going to parties, not sharing bags of chips and peanuts at a social event, shutting down bars and restaurants, is to reduce people from interacting with one another, to reduce infections, and to reduce us from going here. And even if we can't get rid of all of them, if we can keep it down here, our system can take care of you and your mother and your grandmother and so on. So folks, what we have here is our main goal, main purpose is mitigation. And that's the word you've heard on the news all the time. Mitigation, mitigation, mitigation. It's too late at this point to actually say that we've contained the virus because we have not and we cannot. But we need to mitigate the effect of this virus. We need to be on this curve. And this is why it's so important to, to go ahead with those important interventions such as self-isolation. So if you have any symptoms at all, isolate yourself. Try to decrease the interaction with other people so to decrease the transmission of this virus. If you have um, anybody who's vulnerable, they need to socially distance themselves uh, to make sure that they are not also uh, recipients of this virus and the ravaging uh, impact this on their on their health or, or their life. Um, and it's also very important to appropriately hand wash to make sure you're using the proper disinfectants and uh, continue to be very vigilant 
and, and essentially we need to take care of our community by doing all of these interventions. Thank you.